everybody. Welcome to Healthy Conversations. I'm your host, Travis Christofferson. This podcast series brings experts in the field of health covering a range of topics that concern disease prevention and health optimization. In other words, how to look and feel your very best. Our guest today is Dr. Barry Boyd, who is a practicing medical oncologist and pioneer in the field of integrative cancer care. He's an assistant clinical professor of medicine at the Yale School of Medicine and a senior attending medical oncologist at the Yale Cancer Center. Dr. Boyd founded the Integrative Medicine Program at Greenwich Hospital Yale Health Systems and is the founder and president of the Integrative Cancer Care Research Foundation. He is a graduate of Cornell Medical School and completed his medical residency at New York Hospital Cornell Medical Center and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and a fellowship in medical oncology at New York Hospital Cornell. He holds a master's in science and a master's in philosophy from the Institute of Human Nutrition at Columbia University. This interview was, to me, was absolutely fascinating. You'll see from the interview that Dr. Boyd has just an incredible depth and breadth of knowledge. It comes from a lifetime of research, teaching, and practicing medicine. He has, what really comes across is his deep passion and curiosity for learning. We talk about many, many things, but we really touch on the delicate nature of micronutrients and diet with regard to cancer prevention, chronic disease prevention. And we talk a lot about the overwhelming importance of insulin resistance and disease prevention and management. He has an undergraduate degree in evolutionary biology, and he has some really, really unique insights into the role of the immune system in cancer in a way that I found surprising. And over the course of practicing oncology for decades, he shares a lot of unique insights into dietary interventions and really the importance of psychology and stress on health, which I found absolutely fascinating. And finally, this interview series is brought to you by AVERT. AVERT is a physician-led prevention program within Stage Zero Life Sciences. AVERT centers on the detection of the earliest predictive markers of chronic disease using a comprehensive blood markers of inflammation and metabolic function. This program is a unique collaboration of physicians and scientists with expertise in the very specific mission of keeping people healthy. And we are very grateful that Dr. Boyd has contributed to this mission as a member of the Avert Science Advisory Board. So without further delay, let's get to the interview with Dr. Boyd. Dr. Boyd, I am incredibly excited to have you here. Thanks for taking the time this morning. My pleasure. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, I've gotten to know you a little bit over the, over the last year. Uh, so looking back through your career, you've had an incredibly interesting career path where you started off with an undergrad in evolutionary biology. Then you went to Columbia and spent four years studying, worked on a master's in nutritional biochemistry. And then you pivoted to medical school at Cornell and then went on to oncology. So I'm right. just curious, what, what, why, why the shifts? I mean, from evolutionary biology to oncology, that's an interesting path. Well, yeah, and, and, and I think it's fascinating if you get into the details. I'm writing a memoir for my kids so they understand the amazing, fortunate life of, uh, that I've had. Um, I went to Cornell really after two years at an undergraduate two-year college where I was studying veterinary technician work at Delhi, Heights in upstate New York. And they wanted me to go to Oneonta. My advisor says, no, go to Oneonta. It's a great college. He said, no. I'm going to Cornell. Why? Because as a young boy, I was in love with natural history, and I worked at the local Audubon Society as well as the natural, and I wanted to become a naturalist. And my goal was to become an ornithologist, and as part of that, evolutionary biology. So I left uh, my two-year degree, went to Cornell, and finished my bachelor's there where I studied evolutionary biology, ecology, and systematics. Well, they had a great, great program. And so I was really in love with this, right? But of course, it was at the end, it was in the middle of the Vietnam War. And so Mm -hmm. what happened, of course, I saw the incredible times when there were anti-war demonstrations. Barton Hall, which is the big hall at Cornell, was filled with demonstrations. I went to Washington, you know, at a time when everybody was, uh, you know, uh, upset about the Vietnam War and Nixon was in power, et cetera. And I ended up taking a year off after graduation because I wasn't sure where I was going to go. My mother had worked at a company called Continental Baking Company. They were the, ma- the makers of Wonder Bread, Hostess Cupcakes, and Twinkies. And they're and still she around. Helped, yeah. She helped yeah. develop them. Oh, wow. So wow. I was, as, as uh, Dean Atchison used to call it, I was present at the creation of junk food. The, tw- the Twinkie. Right. Yes. So, and in fact, it's on my first slide at 
uh, when I was teaching nutrition at, at Yale, my wife got very embarrassed. I said, these are my early influences. <laughs> and so if you have any, anything, any kind of uh, what they say is co conflicts of interest, I would say, well, my mother did help develop Twinkies and those cupcakes. <laughs> but from that, what happened was I took the year off and I worked at another very famous place called the Strand Bookstore, hmm. which is in the Greenwich Village. It's a very famous bookstore in New York. You know, you know, shelving books and cleaning aisles, et cetera. Very still there. And I then took a job at, at, at uh, Cornell and Memorial working in the radiation therapy research section. And while I was there, they said, you got to promise us two years here, right? Well, yes. my mother, meanwhile, heard about this program at Columbia called the Institute of Human Nutrition, which had just been taken over by a guy named Martin Winnick who was famous for his research on early child development and nutrition work in Chile. And he had a whole group of researchers and he had just taken over as, as the director of this new institute. And he was still at Cornell. So the day I took my job and told him I'd spent two years there, I went across the street to interview him for the program. And he on the spot offered me full tuition and, you know, and living for, uh, for, with a fellowship to do that. I was the first student recruited to the new program. Wow. And they still have people going through that program every year. And it was the most amazing experience huh. because the program was, was mostly physicians and some non-physicians like myself on clinical nutrition. I worked with obesity experts. I also worked on early developmental nutrition and its effect on brain development. I'd run, done some research on thyroid hormone and brain and early uh, brain function. That it was very earlier, early studies looking at cellularity in the brain. But it, it really educated me about, number one, medical nutrition, the experts on obesity, Ted Van Italy, mm. uh, Zay Pissonnier, who is an expert on, on uh, now, has written a lot about diabetes, but also particularly on the focus of non, uh, on um, what, it, what he calls metabolically obese, normal weight individuals, you know, that famous, sure. which is insulin resistance. And so he was really, all of these were my mentors and I spent four years there. And then I applied to medical you, school. Yeah, it's amazing what mentors can do in your life path, right? Just, yes. just bumping into the right person at the right time, they open doors and just influence. Now, when you went to Cornell, for medical school. So you have this background in nutrition, obviously now from, from uh, Columbia. What did you, what were you, what did you learn about nutrition in, in medical school? And was, was there a course on it? No, I learned. <laughs> I'm you setting know, you up I, because I, I read in your, I read in one of your papers that you were shocked that there was such little information about nutrition. Uh, absolutely. You know, they give you a yeah. few, uh, there was uh, Alton Meister, who was an expert on, uh, on one of the, vitamins and he uh, he would give a lecture but it was very very limited and as i said once you got into your third and fourth year clinical the lec the teaching was how do you order a nutrition consult from a dietitian that was it yes and yeah. of course later on i learned how limited their understanding was how was the sort of ada approach that really was not d in depth understanding the origin so i became once I went into practice, and of course, I did my residency also at Cornell in medical oncology. Mm -hmm. And because I had a daughter, I decided I wanted to go to a teaching program. So I left Cornell. Mm -hmm. uh, I could have stayed there on faculty, and I elected to come out here to a, uh, to a university-affiliated hospital where I could teach. That's where you are now, Yale. Right. Yeah. Correct. Correct. It's, okay. a, it's a subsidiary, right. Okay. Okay. Well, let's, t let's talk about nutrition. Right. And, and, and oncology and chemo prevention and cancer prevention and, and active treatment. Let's start, you know, we could start with this anywhere. I know where you sort of the evolution of your thinking on this, just based on reading your, your publications. But let's start with the, the data on individual vitamins and minerals. And, and, you know, when we look at there's so much conflicting data and so much certainly conflicting advice when it comes to nutrition and, and cancer. Um, what can you, what do we know about single, the, the studies that sort of looked at single vitamins, minerals, can we draw many conclusions from those? Well, we can, yes. And, and in fact, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because, again, as you may know, uh, I was lecturing on insulin and cancer with the Cancer Center at Yale and with the, my colleagues in public health. So I invested a huge amount uh, in understanding long-term studies and cohort studies. And so one of 
Emma, the head of chronic epidemiology, yeah, went on sabbatical. So she asked me if I would give her lecture on this very topic, which was on micronutrients and cancer. And it was really around the early studies on trying to prevent, it was the concept called chemo prevention, right. which is the idea that early cancers um, may arise out of deficiency states or inadequacy of certain nutrients. And by giving those single nutrients in higher doses, we can prevent the cancer. And this started with, with Richard Pito, actually, a very famous British epidemiologist, who noted that beta carotene levels in smokers was associated with uh, a reduction in lung cancer risk. So it was either beta carotene intake or levels in their blood seem to correlate with lower lung cancer risk. Again, causation versus correlation. So the theory was maybe we can give beta carotene to prevent lung cancer. I call these the most famous landmark studies that nobody has ever heard of. Now, why do I say that? Because, well, let me tell you the story, what happened. Um, at the time, there was a previous series of studies from Linjuan, China, in a population with extremely high levels of esophageal cancer, right? Mm. And they were known to be extremely nutrient deficient in that population. They had the levels where, you know, 20 times that of mainland China and 100 times that of the West, their levels of this disease. I mean, it was the leading cause of cancer mortality. And they had two population studies there, and they gave them low doses of nutrients, and they showed that they could reduce risk by about 20%. Now, it was not getting them down the baseline where we are, but it seemed to have an effectiveness in lowering that. And so that kind of was a study that reinforced the idea that this might not be a bad thing to do. And so they developed first the ATBC trial that was in Finland, where they gave either beta carotene or vitamin E as alpha tocopherol in high doses in a randomized fashion, four by four. So one, the other, both or neither. And at the end of that study, by the way, there was then a subsequent study in the U.S. called the CARAT trial, haha, uh -huh, carotene and retinoic acid efficacy trial, in which they gave either a animal form of, of vitamin A, retinol, or they gave beta carotene in high dose also. And the first study, the ATBC trial, came back shockingly that the beta carotene increased lung cancer risk by 18%. Now, what was interesting was simultaneous with this, as is always the case, it's a supplement you can buy over the counter. I had patients who started taking beta carotene convinced that if they're studying it, it must be true, right? Yeah. And so they were taking beta carotene as smokers. And then the, when they found this, they did an early exploration of the, of the carrot study and discovered, lo and behold, not an 18, a 28% increase in lung cancer risk, which persisted over time. Then it started to diminish when they were off the, the but it taught us something very, and I have, now I call it boys rules, which is about micronutrients and cancer. And there were subsequent studies on folic acid in colorectal cancer prevention. There was a number of studies looking at straightforward vitamin E. And many of these, certainly the, the beta carotene study taught us something really important. One is that, that, um, that you must be careful to assume efficacy from single studies. Number two, the levels of beta carotene, and I tell people I'm going to stop eating carrots. I said, that's not the point. The level of beta carotene was between 45 and 60 servings of fruits and vegetables a day. So I mean, it was enormously doses. high, and it was incapable okay. of getting there right? And yeah. I've given this lecture to the radiation oncology residents and fellows at Yale. None of them had ever heard of these two trials. Wow. The only people who have ever heard of it are my patients because I tell them about it. Yeah. Well, I what, mean, it's what? disappeared. Yeah, these are, and this just shows you highlights how tricky biology is, right? And, and when you have this kind of seductive, elegant theory where, okay, this is an antioxidant, smokers, are oxidating their lungs, which uh, causes DNA mutations. Right. Let's give them a huge dose of an antioxidant, and theoretically, it should prevent cancer. And and you see the opposite effect. So it's yes. kind of the law of unintended consequences. What yes. can we derive from that? The, you know, and I, I I I'm a big fan of Bruce Ames, the biochemist work. Right, sure. He, he does a lot of work on yeah micronutrients. Right. And the elderly prevention. Bruce Ames now in Australia. Yeah, he's he's a, he's a gem. Right. Good guy. Yeah, but yeah, and he he. I think kind of the general rule that he emphasizes, there's a kind of a U-shaped curve where there's yeah. a sweet spot for these things. You get, if it's too low, you're going to see perhaps more cancer incidence. Too high, same thing. And, yeah, and me, is, yeah, that, me, is that, would that fall into Boyd's rule? Well, Boyd's rules is that. Now, let me tell you what okay. Boyd's rules are. Number one, 
respect nature. In the last 70 years, certainly 50 years, and really with the pandemic, actually, we're seeing people consuming nutrients at levels that are incapable of being reached in nature. Does that make sense? If everybody thinks it's natural, we are consuming levels like beta, and I'll tell you about B12, which is really a very tough problem. B12, it, levels can be reached that are 250 to a million percent of your average daily requirement. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you the story about B12 because it mirrors what we've learned about beta carotene, and nobody knows about this. Nobody yeah. knows about this. these landmark studies about B12, which have just come out in the last year and a half to two years. And I'll tell you that in a minute. But the number one is to respect nature. Why are we giving nutrients and why would people assume that single nutrients at very high doses make sense? Number two, remember the U-shaped curve. Now, the U-shaped curve it has actually five components. An optimal range. At the low end, there is frank deficiency. Where, you know, if everybody is in this range, you're going to have symptoms. Yeah. There is a range between that and optimal called insufficiency, which on a population-wide basis will be associated with potential adverse risk, but you don't know until you follow hundreds or thousands of people. That's one of the keys about these ranges. On the other side is the toxicity range, right? So everybody knows if you have extremely high Vitamin D, there's a risk of hypercalcemia, stones, et cetera, right? Vitamin A, pseudotumor cerebri, hypertension, you know, CNS, headaches, bad consequences, fetal malformations, right? With very, very high animal-based vitamin A. But the one that I focus on is the adverse risk range, the range that populations consuming high levels of nutrients that aren't toxic may not ever realize there's a problem. And the, the problem with the adverse risk range is it's above the optimal range. It's something that you get into by taking levels beyond what you normally would get. And in this optimal range, uh, adverse risk range, many people get there through their unwittingly taking supplements. Their risk for disease may be 2 3 or 4% higher than normal. It may double a risk of a rare disease. So mm -hmm. an example of adverse risk range is certainly what we learned about beta carotene, right? I'll get yeah. to the, the third rule in a minute. Okay. Um, but the adverse risk range um, is uh, ranges like when you take high levels of vitamin D, and this has been reported multiple times in multiple follow-up studies, very high levels beyond the, the, the necessary range has been associated with a doubling of risk of pancreatic cancer and upper GI cancers. Nobody knows that. I didn't know that. Yes, and wow. I can gladly provide you with very, very strong data on that. And here's one of the reasons that it's, it's quite, because vitamin D is the magic vitamin, right? Everybody wants vitamin D. And of course, now we don't have deficiency because everybody knows about it, everybody takes it. But the studies that were, that were reviewed by the National Academy of Sciences Food Nutrition Board, of which Susan Maines, my colleague, was part of, looked at vitamin D and discovered this adverse association with cancers, which is why they lowered the recommended levels from 30 to 100 down to 20 to about 50, 45 to 50 as the risk. Now, the Endocrine Society doesn't believe that, but they have been very powerfully pushed by one of the favorites of vitamin D metabolism, as you probably know. Yeah. And I think it's an issue that we need to be careful about. And I'll tell you, and then I presented this data at a cancer nutrition meeting in Washington now about 10 years ago, a study of young adult skateboarders in Hawaii. Now, how do we get vitamin D? Unless you're an Eskimo and you get lots of vitamin D rich fish and oils in the in the in the animals you eat, which is where you get skateboarding in Hawaii is the other skateboarding way. in Hawaii. So they get <laughs> lots of sun. They get 28, 26 hours or more of sun a day, no sunscreen, lots of sun exposure. They get tan, so they protect themselves. By the way, I can even say why they think that's why tanning occurs. And why, you, why do you need to protect yourself from sun? It destroys folic acid in the vessels. I don't know if you know that. Interesting. I didn't the, know that. Yeah, that's one of the theories because it prevents folate deficiency in mothers. And so they risk, uh, you know, where they might risk adverse uh, outcomes from pregnancy. And so the theory is sun protection is part of the need to reduce folic acid degradation in vessels in the, in the surface of the sun rather than preventing vitamin D and rather than, you know, and obviously you have skin cancer risk. But uh, at any rate, the vitamin D study showed that those men who spent all this time outside, 
their median level was 28 and nobody could get up to 60. Oh, so there's a, there's a natural limiting. Yes. We've evolved to have a, a limiting, yeah. right. Okay. Well, More that's important. fascinating. The yeah. idea of, of, of 30 to 100 was based on the theory of suppression of parathyroid hormone, which it's reciprocally related to. But that's like saying if a person has hyper, hypothyroidism, you want to give them enough thyroid to completely suppress TSH, which is the equivalent. That wouldn't make uh -huh. sense either. Right. And that's right. where the data came from, this misapplication of a theory of how much vitamin D you need. We're, we're, we just, we're, we're not as smart as we think we are, right? Exactly. We that's number make... three. That's rule number three. <laughs> and rule number three is the law of unintended consequences. Right. You think you right. know what you're doing. Now, why do you think beta carotene raises lung cancer risk? Well, everybody says it's a pro-oxidant in the lung. Well, it turns out, you know, that oxidative damage is a dual sword. At low levels of ox at high levels of oxidative stress, it damages cells. But tumor cells are far more vulnerable to oxidative stress than normal cells. And so when people mm -hmm. inadvertently take a lot of antioxidants, they may actually promote the growth of tumors. Tumors themselves upregulate oxidative pathways, including NF kappa B, uh, not NF kappa B, I'm sorry, but uh, the NERF2. Uh, complex with activates the expression of antioxidant enzymes. So tumors love antioxidants. And yeah. so when people take a lot of antioxidants, even James Watson, I'll show you how the public is not aware of people. I tell people, you know who James Watson is, right? And people say, well, who's that? You ever heard of DNA? Mm, no, not really. <laughs> I was it's just going to say, <laughs> you know, I was they just going to say history. that. Right, because his the article he released, oh, what do you think, six, seven years ago now, he said was his greatest epiphany since the elucidation of the structure of DNA. And it was that. It was this, exactly. this interconnected relationship between oxidative stress and cancer and how antioxidants could be preventing, um, causing more deaths, frankly, during cancer treatment. Than, exactly, exactly. Right. And, you know, and one of those examples that I'm interested in, I have a case I'm still presenting, and this is really worth it, is the role of IV vitamin C. Mm. Now, which IV turns into C, an oxidant. It's right, which is a pro-oxidant right. when given in mm -hmm. high doses. Mm -hmm. And the case that I'm, uh, two cases I have are patients with BRCA mutations. Now, BRCA2 is associated with an eight times higher risk of pancreatic cancer than normal. Now, mm. everybody thinks of the, the chromosomal abnormalities with BRCA and reciprocal trans, all the things that it corrects. But it turns out that the BRCA complex regulates antioxidant responses. It turns on many of these enzymes. And so when tumors are bracket deficient, they have lost the ability to control oxidative stress because they re they're, they're, so they're more vulnerable than non bracket patients. And so when you combine a high dose vitamin C and bracket de deficient pancreatic cancer, they have a much greater therapeutic benefit. And that's what the trial is about. And that's something that Luke Cantley at Cornell was very interested in. Because he is the one who showed that ascorbic acid has an anti-tumor effect in KRAS mutant colon cancer, now particularly pancreatic. Yeah. Let, let's go back. The vitamin B12, you, you piqued my curiosity on that. You were going to say about the, the, the well, massive doses of B12 and the well, consequences. Yeah, let's, yeah let's, let's talk about B12 because, yes, there are a significant number of people as they get older who may malabsorb B12. The, the requirement for B12 is around 2.4, 2.5 micrograms. There's a very efficient active transport mechanism in the distal small bowel coupled with intrinsic factor from the stomach. But a lot of people have a loss of intrinsic factor through a number of reasons. Their stomach, gastric, atrophic gastritis, loss of the, the ability to produce it. But in B12 at high levels, when you give it as a sublingual or mucus-based, uh, you can get enormous absorption of it independent of active transport in the colon. So you can bypass all of that. And of course, they, they advertise sprays, you know, and feel better. And one of, the, one of the great myths is it's B vitamins. This is another myth. You can't overdose on B vitamins because they're, you pee them out, right? Yeah. They're water-soluble. Yeah. Well, not really. That shows you the ignorance of the general public and people in medicine, as I said, they medicine they know nothing about supplements or vitamins because they have no training in this. The th the key about water soluble vitamins is if you take a high dose every day, your tissues are bathed in that until you stop taking it. They're bathed in high B twelve with that vitamin, and then you pee it out. But that's the same thing as if you have a water soluble 
renally excreted medication. You know, it, it doesn't mean it doesn't work because you pee it out. That's the way you excrete the, the medicine. And yeah. the key is if you're compliant with the B vitamin the same way as the medicine, it'll have an effect until you stop it. That's that. Number one, two, B12 is unique in that it is stored in the liver. So we know that you can build up B12 levels. And so if you become B12 deficient by virtue of inadequate intake or other reasons, it can take years to become, frankly, B12 deficient. But the trouble with B12 is it's become the vitamin du jour. I'm tired. I'm fatigued. They advertise it for that. Doctors give B12 over and over and over again as a way to make a pay. Well, let's give them B12. Neurologists use it for neuropathy unrelated to B12 deficiency. Mm. And we know that the placebo effect is substantial. So people will feel like they're getting benefit. I mean, I have a case that I also am going to report on, which is fascinating, but it's and very frustrating. Um, but what we've learned is that people can take B12 levels way, way above normal levels. We do know that high B12 levels have been correlated with prognosis in cancer. And there's a group of researchers from Scandinavia who've measured B12 and shown that it correlates with adverse outcomes. That could be not that could be reverse causation. Tumors elevate the level of binding protein, elevate the level of B12, and so more advanced cancers are going to have higher B12 levels. So that doesn't tell you as much. It doesn't say it's a it's after the fact. It is related to the cancer, it doesn't cause the cancer. Now there was a study in Scandinavia called the Wenbit and Norbit study. They are not supplemented in their diet like we are with folate and B vitamins, right? That's to prevent neural tube defects. That's the way the West has been, but they have avoided that. So they're a fairly clean population. And in that study, they randomized them to folate B12 and B6. And they found that B12, particularly with folate, was associated with a higher incidence of cancer and most specifically with lung cancer. Wow. Yeah, unexpected. Interesting. And, you know, it goes back, I'm just thinking back to the history of this. I remember, I think it was in the Emperor of Maladies, the, the history of Sidney Farber, when he was developing, I think it was methotrexate, yes. the kind of yeah, anti-folate. Yeah, and he first tried giving uh, patients folate because and, and it just accelerated the cancer growth. Yes. So these kind of less... The acceleration phenomena. Yeah, right. I learned I'm, that in my, my, early, uh, my early lectures on that. Yeah, yeah. so let's talk let, now, okay, where... Where does the general population stand within, I'm going to just call these Boyd's rules from now on, within the, the U-shaped curve, within the sweet spot? Can we say that there's a, a general deficiency or because of supplementation, we're just getting these erratic sort of I, concentrations throughout the population? I think it varies, you know, and, I, and I'll tell you in a second because I want to finish the B12 because oh, that's, I'm sorry. The, that's the beginning of the story. Okay, keep going. Yeah, so <laughs> the other part of the story is, well, what about, long-term observational epidemiology. That's where you take a population, you measure everything you can, and you see what happens to them, right? Right. And one of those series of studies was looking at B12 and outcome. Now, here's what they did. They looked at every single major cohort study in the world and pooled them together. This was published last year at International, uh, I think, International Cancer Journal. And they looked at the levels of intake in, uh, and levels of B12. And this was done in the NCI, the American Cancer Society, CPS 1 and 2, Dana-Farber, the Harvard uh, Public Health Studies, you know, from their group, uh, University of Pittsburgh, UCLA, everywhere, Oxford, Cambridge, uh, the EPIC studies from Europe, Asian studies. So they pooled this huge cohort. Of patients measuring, there was a there was a le, there was a, a a dose related impact of higher B12 on cancer risk. Wow! Now now here's the problem with that. That's the only first part of the study. They asked another question. They said, "How do we know it's causal versus coincidence?" Right? Mm-hmm. What we what we sure. call you know missing confounders is the term that's used. It's really not the B12, but something else. Mistaken so they then did causation for correlation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. there's a newer approach in epidemiology called Mendelian randomization. Sounds fancy. It's actually really simple, and it's being used in enormously widespread studies now to to try to confirm that what we think is causal versus not might be more deterministic based on in the genetic risks for that. 
So they measured a number of, of polymorphisms, gene, genetic polymorphisms that are inherited that predict high versus low B12. As a way of saying it's not environmental, it really is real, it really is, or it's not confounded, it really is a real association. And in the B12 studies, they confirmed that those genetic predictors of higher B12 level are associated with higher lung cancer risk. Wow. Okay, so, so someone's genetically just predisposed to absorb more. Is that, and is have that, more. And there are a number of different and have more. Yeah, now here's okay. another part of this. Simultaneous with this, there's been an effort to, you know, the PET scan, which uses glucose, and it uses a molecule called fluorodeoxyglucose to show where tumors are. So you can use a PET scan where there's active metabolism, and we can then talk about glucose metabolism, which is another part of this, this talk. And it's fascinating because it does illustrate the important role of, of you know, the, the glucose dependency of cancers. Mm -hmm. Now, glucose is the fuel. Now, I tell you this because it's really important. There's a number of different studies that use B12 as a marker. And B12 labeled in a PET modality can target where the tumor is. So tumors are preferentially taking up B12 They're taking well. up B12 because they need B12. Why? B12 is essential for DNA synthesis, sure. single carbon metabolism. B12 mm. is critical for tumor growth. Lastly, in a group of studies from a multi-cohort, multi that's actually not multi-cohort, but a multi-center trial of, of chemotherapy and breast cancer called the, um, uh, by SWAG, in one of the large cooperative groups, they embedded within that a, uh, a research protocol called DELCAP, in which they analyzed supplement use among women with breast cancer in the trial. And they then looked at the outcomes. And they found three things which are very, very predictable. Combination antioxidants had some increase in risk of recurrence and mortality. B12 had the highest association. It doubled the risk of recurrence and breast cancer mortality. B12, supplementation. Nobody knows this. Nobody what? knows this. Nobody, That's exactly why I'm trying to get this out there. Yeah, people yeah. are unaware of this. So I've told doctors about being careful because, you know, I once went to Costco. I always embarrassed my wife. I went to Costco and there's a woman hawking CoQ10 right on the counter there and all the vitamins are up on the wall. And I picked yeah. the B12 off. It's 5,000 micrograms, right? And I turn it around and I say to her, can you tell me how much of this do I need? And she looks at the label and she said, Oh my God, why did they do that? And that is the expression, indeed, why did they do that? More is better. That's the American myth. More is better. That is a, right. I, I, that intrinsic bias of if something's good for me, more is better. Absolutely. I remember reading a, st a study on, uh, oh, maybe two or three years ago about, you know, they always look at centenarians and just analyze them. How, did, how on earth did they get to live this long? And one of them was just uh, serum vitamin D levels. And they found a, a, a inverse correlation that the, the centenarians tended to have lower vitamin D levels than the, you know, what they thought was healthy. Right, so you right. see these sort of clues along the way that don't make sense of in that paradigm. And, yeah. yeah. Of course, you know, a level is a snapshot in time. And right, so we make exactly. mistakes. And, yeah. and this is what, you know, functional medicine will very often do this broad panel of sub, of levels, not, not to, you know, argue pro or con. And then they tell you what supplements to take because it's this, so that's sort of what they promote. But that's right. missing the huge point. It's right. missing the huge point. It is long term. Now, there's a fascinating corollary to that. And that is the, the fourth rule, which is the Boyd's rules of fourth rule, which is the money rule. The people who take it don't need it. And the people who need it don't take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we, yeah. we have this another bias is we we think money should buy us everything, health, right, everything. Right. And, but I'll tell you right. part of that money rule. Why the uh, Annals of Internal Medicine had to stop taking that supplement. It's worthless, right? They yeah. were wrong. They were even quoting in the same paper the Preventive Task Force on uh, multivitamins and and outcomes, and they quoted two papers in that two trials that actually showed benefit for cancer. You know, one was the, there was a companion to the ATBC trial that was done in France um, that showed that low levels of nutrients reduce lung cancer in men. And then the multivitamin study from the men's health uh, professional follow-up study, 
my Graziano and colleagues, showed a reduction in cancer about 2%, but an 8% reduction in men who had cancer. And I always said, well, what is it about those two studies that show benefit in men? Men don't eat their veggies. Right. <laughs> we forget that there may be gender differences in people and their supplement needs. And sure. so a simple multivitamin has never been shown, with one exception, the, the, uh, um, the women's health uh, study in, in Iowa, Iowa Women's Health Study, which actually only showed that taking high levels of, um, uh, I'm sorry, of, not the, um, I'll get to it in a minute, of um, iron had adverse effects. And we know that that was also true in the in that DELCAP study of women with breast cancer, that iron also, and of course, women in Iowa were postmenopausal. They didn't need iron, but women keep taking it. And that also is a pro-oxidant that can cause damage. So maybe the take-home rule with all this, tell me if you agree with this characterization, is you eat a good diet. If you eat a good diet, you're getting all those micronutrients in the proper ratios. Is it as easy as that? Uh, almost. Almost. And I'll tell you, you know, what is the best diet? You know, now we, we obviously can discuss and we will at some point macronutrient composition of diets for cancer. But if you. That's where we're going to go next. Yeah. Yeah and, yeah. and, you know, every study looking at single compounds is shown. And my, one of my favorite uh, um, is the magic in the food basket or the, uh, the this was by uh, the, the Boston cookbook. Yeah. Um, and it looked at all the magic foods. He said it is implausible that every single one of these foods can prevent cancer in the levels that are taken. The only magic food I think of, by the way, is coffee, you know, just because it's so richly endowed with antioxidants. And it does prevent chronic liver disease. And it's, it's linked to that anyway. But generally, when we think of magic foods, we get away from the idea of dietary patterns. And that's been the, the focus for the last 10 to 15 years in most epidemiology is a pattern of diet. And the classic one is the Western style diet, which is high in, you know, fatty foods, um, processed foods, which we now know from a number of studies are adversely associated with that with multiple diseases. And that's a big issue. So the, the classic pattern that everybody likes is the, the, um, the Mediterranean diet, you know, which is high in, in plants, plant-based foods, uh, you know, fruits and vegetables, olive oil, maybe a little wine, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll make it aside in a second, as well as whole grains. And so clearly, if you look at Mediterranean diet studies, they do appear uh, to show a reduction in many diseases. And this all started, started with Ansel Keys and his, his three and then his seven country study where he analyzed instance. Now, it's worth noting that Ansel Keys' major population study was in Crete back in the 50s. Oh. You know, and Ansel Keys, of course, is best known for K-rations. You know, when he was a professor at University of Minnesota, and he helped develop K-rations for the troops during World War II. But he studied a population that, in retrospect, fasted 180 days a year. How did fasted 100? Why, why was that? Well, it was a, it was a Greek Orthodox population. And okay. fasting was a natural part. Now, they didn't all stop eating. They, you know, it could be meat one day. It could be other components of their diet. But fasting was a natural part of that. So I retrospectively analyzed the Mediterranean basin. So what do you have in the Mediterranean basin? You have the Western, uh, you know, Roman Catholics. You have the Muslims. You have the, the Jewish population. You have many different people around the Mediterranean basin, all of which used um, fasting as a tech, as a, an approach, because most of those countries were ruled not by, by secular leaders, but by religious leaders. Now imagine being a religious leader and you know that the harvest is coming in the spring and early summer. And my God, we better not run out of food. So what do you do for your population? You impose a religious ritual that tells you you got to cut back on food intake so we don't run out of, you know, we don't eat ourselves out of house and home. And, the, and you know, I, it came to mind in, in uh, Myanmar, you know, Burma, during a hurricane. And they said the worst thing about it was it came during the hunger season. What's the hunger season? It was spring before the harvest. Before the harvest. Yeah. And so I, I had one, one of my colleagues is a psychiatrist and Jewish got very mad at me. 
when I tried to say that maybe this was an evolutionary mechanism that populations around the Mediterranean used to avoid eating all the food before the harvest, which may be flawed. There may be a, a problem because then he'd lose, they'd lose people. They, would, they wouldn't be able to have enough food to sustain them. Yeah. So it's an intriguing idea that part of the Mediterranean diet really came out through the use of fasting as a ritual. And the data was muddled by the fact that they were historically yes, fasting. exactly. Interesting, exactly. fascinating. Never mind wow. that there was no, no processed food, you know. Right. And, and right, of course, right. the social situation was different. They all lived together. They didn't have mobility. You know, an Italian meal now is not Mediterranean, as you probably know. <laughs> right, right, yeah. No, it's, it's that, that brings up so many fascinating. So, you know, looking at your sort of evolution and, how the guard to diet, nutrition, and cancer, you notice this massive correlation between insulin and the IGF-1 pathways. Right. And, and this, uh, you know, clearly ties into what we're talking about. To, as a population, it's even fair to say worldwide, we, I think the general rule is we eat too often and too much. And, and, and when you look at, this kind of evolutionary paradigm where we had really had no choice to fast. And, right. and I'm going to go off kind of on a tangent here, but the, the recent data on this, there's too much, too much, too many elegant things happening when a person is in a fasted state to, to not sort of make that kind of leap that, well, because this happened over millions of years where we didn't have food, evolution built in these pleiotrophic benefits to going without food. And it goes all the way to autoimmunity, cancer, turning off the insulin IGF pathways for a period of time. I, have you heard? Of, have you seen the studies on the on the Lorenz syndrome in Ecuador? Oh yeah, yeah. sure, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. I figured you would. Right. And yeah. I'll tell I'll tell the listeners if, um, if they I haven't heard of it. Lectures but, on IGF. I call it the 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 meta, the metabolic basis for integrative cancer care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that and, illustrates and, the critical points. You know, as yeah. as many of the you know, and of course the one of the guys who I who I really admire his work from USC um, in his work on fasting and cancer, of course, and he cites the same thing. Yeah, well, it's you know, you don't often get those unique experimental populations where you have where you have a control, you have an experimental group within the population due to some mutation. It's like a knockout mice that you can observe right, in right. humans. But, but what they have is um, a mutation in the, the receptor for IGF-1. And, and IGF-1 is, of course, closely related to insulin. It's an anabolic hormone. And so they have dwarfism. They have very short stature. But what was so intriguing about this population was cancer was virtually non-existent, right. as was type 2 diabetes. It was basically knocked it out. So it's a strong suggestion that constantly stimulating these pathways, and you, you can tell us how we stimulate these pathways. Right. It sets the stage for cancer, right? right. So, right. so let's talk about that, Doctor Boyd. The insulin. I, I actually have a picture of Sadie, and I say, "What's what? What is the story with Sadie? She's 104. She has that classic mutation. She is uh -huh. short, stubby, and not underweight. You know, she's actually overweight. Yeah. But well, they have a horrible cancer. lifestyle. Yes. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> So, you know, so, we miss the fact that it's not necessarily the weight may be a correlate with some things when you don't have that mutation. But it is right. a clue to how important insulin IGF is. And I wrote that paper. I also wrote a book called The Cancer Recovery Plan in 2003 around the whole idea that insulin and insulin resistance, and that really came out of work that I was working with a woman at, in, she's now in Toronto, I wasn't working with her, but I, I was very familiar and, and communicated with her and discussed this, named Pam Goodwin, who was one of the first, and she showed that in breast cancer, fasting insulin at diagnosis was prognostic for outcome. And that was really in the early 2000s. And so that was a clue that this is playing a very important role in cancer. Now, the question is this, High levels of glucose are associated with high levels of insulin. Is it glucose or insulin? High levels of insulin are correlated with high levels of IGF-1 and part through their effect on binding proteins that limit the, 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 uh, the binding and allow for higher levels of free IGF-1. 
So which of these, we know from the, the studies, which of these are truly the mediators? Is it IGF-1? Is it insulin or glucose? Now, clearly, tumors depend on glucose, and we know now this enormous work on cancer um, metabolism, what's called a reprogramming of metabolism through a number of different um, uh, uh, mechanisms, including genetic mutations that upregulate glucose uptake. They go all down, up and down the line. They alter the metabolism. And of course, the argument has been, and we're all familiar with this, is it fundamentally a defect in, in mitochondrial metabolism of glucose and nutrients, or is it intrinsic to the cancer cell, this reprogramming that occurs? That's the question. That's the right. Somatic mutation right. versus the mitochondrial theory of Thomas right. Seyfried. Now, there are arguments why it could be mutational, and a lot of that is dependent on the fact that, and this is work from a lot of my colleagues at Memorial, for instance, who've written a lot about this, the, uh, uh, the idea that, that cancer metabolism is designed to shift glucose into proliferation and away from burning. So I have this wonderful diagram of yeah. lumber. Luke and Kelly's I see if you burn all the lumber, right, you have nothing left to build a house. Right, right. And that's exactly what happens if you burn glucose right through the TCA cycle into maximum amount of ATP. There is no nutrient metabolites left for cell building. And that's been the argument. The other side of that argument has been that the same process that occurs with tumor reprogramming, upregulating glucose and glutamine, by the way, that's one of the other critical nutrients in this. And there's this idea of both glucose and glutamine addiction in tumors. But the other thing is it's not isolated to tumors. It's a feature of rapid early fetal growth, by the way. Fetal growth is associated with reprogramming to maximize growth. And the second one is T-cells. T cells are dependent on reprogramming of their metabolism when they need to have a burst of rapid cell proliferation. And of course, what happens is two things that shunt some of the glucose metabolites into the pentose phosphate shunt, which is important for, for building nucleotide blocks. synthesis. Yeah. Yeah. And also NADPH. Now, why is that important? Because NADPH in tumor cells upregulates glutathione. And tumors depend on the antioxidant effect of glutathione. Hey, a reminder, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, you get so, lactic acid as a side effect, and you get the acidic microenvironment that's associated with that upright regulating, uh, uh, you know, H, uh, HIF, HIF, you know, hypoxia inducing factor, uh, angiogenesis, all the other tumor features that are linked to that. Yeah. I, I, this renaissance and the understanding of what cancer is to me is fascinating because you, 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 you know, you, you know well that the somatic mutation theory, the mid seventies when Varmus and Bishop won the Nobel prize and that really cemented this idea that mutations were the driving role. And now we have these interesting clues about what you said earlier about how it's sort of going back to this embryonic kind of uh, geno, ex, genotype expression, which, right, right. which, Right, gives the idea that that epigenetic changes are a huge driver of this. Why is why is it so consistent that cancer cells look a lot like early embryonic cells, which are highly glycolytic and doing all these things? And and then the, then you have these met you know Tom Seyfried claiming well the crux it's mitochondrial damage it's shifting all of these problems the epigenetic right. changes the mutations are kind of secondary but anyway I think you know all in all it's a it's a much more comprehensive it's more complex exciting. than it is. Yeah. Yeah, more exciting, exactly, right? And, yeah. and it brings in new therapies into this realm of and it brings in possibility. Diet, diet is diet in a central. big way. Yes, yes, yeah, and 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 reducing glucose. You know, I think most people just think, well, that's a fuel for cancer. And like you just said, well, it also changes the antioxidant st antioxidant status through the pentose phosphate pathway. So all of these kind of things kind of coalesce into yes. new ideas. And new of course, treatments. glutamine, you know, which people use as a supplement now, and Aspen, which is the American Society for Parental Nutrition, no longer recommends glutamine in high doses for cancer patients because tumors depend on glutamine. They they obviously will deaminate it. It's converted to glutamate, uh, to glutamate through uh, glutamase on the membrane surface. It's taken up and it's used for citrate in the synthesis and the TCA cycle as a substitute for glucose. 
you know, and lipid synthesis. So we know that glutamine is really a central mediator of many of these effects. And the idea of using very high dose of glutamine may not be a smart idea for, you know, mucosal protection, diarrhea, a lot of reasons people do it. You know, I'm yeah. a little agnostic because we don't have trials. We don't right, have right. the data to say that. But it's an argument about being cautious about, again, the law of unintended consequences, which we do all the time. Rules. Yes, well, let's yes. sum this nutrition bit up. So I, I'm going to sum it up from what I heard, which is eat less often, eat a whole food diet um, to try to get all these micronutrients in the right ratios. Where do you stand on sort of macronutrient ratios within for people Yeah, uh, with regard to this insulin and IGF equation? Well, it, it gets back to my belief that in the real world, um, there are huge studies that are Mendelian randomization studies now, looking at the epidemiology of what correlates with, and you know, you and I, we all talk about this. I believe insulin resistance is the disease of the 20th century. And I'm going to go back to a fascinating study by Jerry Reven, who I've known, who since passed away the master, the father of Syndrome X, who described insulin resistance. Jerry was a endocrinologist at Stanford. And he and I had had discussions about this because he did a study in a journal of clinical endocrinology that is back in the early 2000s in which he put people, he, no, he didn't put them on anything. He actually divided a large group of, of adults who were not obese, had no illness, into three categories low, intermediate, and high insulin sensitivity. And then he simply followed them over time. The people with the, with the, high, the lowest insulin sensitivity got two-thirds of all illnesses. They got cardiovascular disease, stroke, hypertension, diabetes, and to su- a surprise to him at the time, cancer. All the chronic the people diseases. in the intermediate sensitivity got one-third of all events, the people with the highest insulin sensitivity, that is the least insulin resistant, got no events. Wow. It is worth reading this paper because it's not a huge epi study or a huge randomized trial, but it is really illustrates, and the title is Age-Related Disease Linked to Insulin Resistance. Age-Related wow. Disease. Now we know that the, and I focus more and more on the role of the insulin receptor and there are actually at least two receptors, and then there are hybrid receptors between insulin as well as IGF, and they're all found on tumor cells. There's a whole group out of Italy that have done a lot of work on understanding this. But the two receptors are the Ig, uh, the insulin receptor A. The insulin receptor A is a mitogenic receptor. It actually turns out to be on many epithelial cells, and when insulin binds, it activates cell proliferation. And then there's the insulin receptor B, which is the metabolic receptor. And interestingly, it's much more highly expressed on metabolic tissues like muscle, liver, and adipose. Whereas the insulin receptor A is on embryonic cells. That's one of the embryonic receptors to activate cell growth because insulin is very important in cell division and growth. Um, and one of the things that I go back to is how do we explain the origins of cancer in the 20th century? And it turns out that there are two things. Uh, and, you know, this goes back to the very interestingly, how do we parse out the data about the origins of cancer? And Tomasetti, uh, you know, the, the famous paper, Cancer is Bad Luck. You know, Tomasetti and uh, what am I blocking? My, uh, Vogelstein. Vogelstein. Yeah, Vogelstein. Yeah. Bert Vogelstein. And the idea that, that many cells undergo spontaneous mutations that occur as part of cell division, three mutations on average, and he correlated the number of cell divisions in, and the number of, actually the number of tissue stem cells in a tissue uh, and its risk for cancer over years based on that correlated the high probability of cancer in, in tissues that ha- have higher stem cell numbers. Now, what he left out, and he didn't have good epidemiology because he's using 20th, early 21st century data and he failed to look at the epidemiology of cancer over time, where cancer clearly has increased. So what has happened in the last 100 years? And I look at the data on transi- and epidemiologic transitions and a lot of the population-based data. And what's fascinating is two things. We have grown in height by four inches. 
Yeah, isn't that fascinating? And height is clearly linked to cancerous. Now, why would it be? Now, what's the leading cause of height? What is the leading? We always think it about genetics, but there's a polygenic trait, but how tall you are is highly dependent on your early diet. First three years, number one. And what is the one nutrient that is somatotropic that leads to increasing height? People call it as a hormone. It's not just hormones. It's the food that is designed to make you grow quickly. Dairy. Yes, it's got it's you know, the only nutrient or, or food out there with all three groups, right? Carbohydrates, lots of carbs, right. fat, right. and protein. Yeah, yeah, and of course, the T. Colin Campbell blames dairy for the incidence of cancer in China in his in, you know his China study, etc. But it turns out that that's not fully correlated. There's a lot of argument. But what's interesting is the tallest people in the world are the Dutch. Why they had the after World War II, they had the highest intake of dairy in the world, and it looks at Now, what do they offset that with? No, because there's two components, height, and we know that in men, shared risk factors for for cancer between men and women who have the same cancer sites, pancreas, colon, et cetera, in shared cancers, height accounts for the majority of the higher risk in men than women for cancer. Yeah, in body mass and and species, right? When you look at Body mass is the next step, and I'm going to get to that in a second. Another study, the BRCA genes, of course, increase cancer risk, right? This is another study nobody's ever heard of. And it was fascinating because in Iceland, they have what's called a BRCA2 mutation, a founder mutation in that population. Now, what happened between World War I and World War II? They didn't go anywhere. They didn't have the Holocaust. They didn't have the problem that the BRCA1 population and the Eastern European Ashkenazi population had, which made these studies harder. They had great statistics. They followed women over years. And they did a very interesting thing. They analyzed the date of birth to the risk of cancer in BRCA carriers. Hmm. So women who were born in 1920 and followed for se- through 70 years, their risk of developing breast cancer was around 17 to 18%. Women born in 1950, their risk of breast cancer was 68%. Four wow. times greater risk over time with the same high-risk susceptibility gene. Hmm. Interesting. What right? changed? So well, I'll tell you a that. second. Here's what's even more interesting. Okay. They analyzed the the siblings of the probands, those who were sisters who didn't have the gene. They started at a little higher level than the general population, and their risk went up four times. Hmm. And they looked at the general population, their risk went up four times. So in women who had the gene, they started at a higher level. But their risk went up with environmental change. And it argues that we're, and people come to me now who have the gene, because I explain there's much more to it than just you're going to get it or you're not, right? And of course, we have to be careful because many of the things that play a role here, we've already passed, like how tall you are. Height is part of that difference. The height has gone up four inches in that period of time. Now, all women with a gene are not tall. But it's more, it's exercise, it's weight gain, it's all of the other factors that Thomas Setti, uh, at that, that, you know, and Vogelstein missed when they looked at the simple, simplistic idea that it's spontaneous. Right. Too much reductionism, right, yes. Dr. Boyd? Too much yeah. reductionism, right. Yeah, now there's a corollary to the Jerry Reven story, which I always talk about. And that is a study looking at South Africans, and A.R. Walker, who is an epidemiologist in Africa, analyzes many of these studies. He's in Wits Waters World. And he looked at a very, he did a very interesting thing in 1970. He analyzed outcomes of different groups beginning at age 50 and who was most likely to survive to 70, right? So the old idea, and this is again, another concept, is that cancer occurs because you get older. And this is where I disagree firmly, even with Robert Weinberg, who talked about this. Oh. I'll tell you why. Okay. The blacks in South Africa at that time, pre-HIV, of course, right? Because that had a major impact on that population. The blacks had a median lifespan of maybe 36 to 40. Median lifespan, right? Wow. And I, I will tell you, by the way, the importance of the median is not the message. That is uh, Stephen Jay Gould's discussion. When he was told that he had two years to live, that was the median survival. He said, well, that's good news because that means half the people live beyond two years and he never died of mesothelioma. He died of a missed lung cancer on an x-ray. You know, he's a famous evolutionary biologist from Harvard who lived in Brooklyn. (laughs) But anyway, 
the story is this. When they analyzed the data, even though the blacks had a median lifespan that was much shorter than the Caucasians and the Indians, the highest survival from 50 to 70 was in the blacks. Why? Disproportionate childhood mortality, infectious yeah. disease, trauma, tuberculosis. If you make it to 10, chances are you'll live longer. And this is now studies on hunter-gatherer populations when we make the mistake of assuming that median lifespan equals low adult survival. If you make it through adolescence, the probability of surviving into adulthood is much greater. More importantly, that population had no colon cancer, very limited breast cancer, no heart disease. They were thin, lean, and mean, and they walked everywhere. They yeah. are the example in the study of Jerry Reven of the most insulin sensitive population. Wow. So I'm gonna I'm gonna sum this up. We've, we've decoupled ourselves from nature, right? I mean, we spend most of yeah. our time walking, eating normal whole foods. Right. And the next thing is to avoid Hostess cupcakes and Twinkies. Yes. Sorry, mom. <laughs> <laughs> or the right. other thing I talk about is the stages of nutritional stages of cancer. So there's another sequel to this, and that is people with really advanced cancer who might have three or four months to live, right? And, and I remember seeing a woman whose daughter was putting on a Zen macrobiotic diet and she was in hospice at home. Mm -hmm. And so she was losing weight. She was very unhappy. She clearly had symptoms from her end-stage disease. The husband asked me to come in and I very gently talked to the daughter. And I said, there is a time at which cancer does not respond to nutritional input. Your goal now is to maximize calories. I wouldn't say Coke, but I asked her, what would you like? And now she was getting the classic really high grains, a lot of things she wasn't, that were not appetizing for her. And she was at a point in her life where she needed to look at food as enjoyment and no longer as, you know, a necessary medicine. And the daughter didn't understand that because she was doing everything she could. And I told the daughter very gently, I said, your mom is now in a stage of her disease that does not respond to these interventions, maybe 10 years ago, five years ago. But with her advanced disease, she needs to eat what she wants that will give her calories because weight loss and muscle loss are really crucial determinants of survival at the end of cancer. And I asked her what she wanted. She said, I want a hamburger. And I told her it's okay to have a hamburger. I always yeah. said the key to nutrition and joy is the best treatment for cancer. Never forget that. I saw that quote that you had. And I, I was going to ask you about that because I, I, I noticed it. Let's, let's go on to what well, we touched on exercise. And, you know, exercise obviously fits into this, this lowering of increasing right. insulin sensitivity. And, and there's some studies that, on exercise that are pretty profound. Um, and I found this one really interesting. They put kind of a yardstick to it. Uh, with regard to colon cancer, the benefit of exercise was much greater than that of, a, of accompanying adjunctive chemotherapy. Right, right. And, and, and breast cancer, um, uh, what is it? It was physical activity and outcomes in early breast cancer reported that women who exercised four to, four to five hours weekly had marked reductions in breast cancer recurrence. And this is something, again, that I don't know how much oncologists talk about about this. I assume very little when, when especially early stage and, and talk about the need for exercise. Yeah, very early on they don't. There's a fascinating, now I will tell you in a minute, I'll tell you about Mendelian randomization and all of these things. So that mm -hmm. the problem with Mendelian randomization is picking genes that predict exercise. It's like picking genes that predict who's going to drink coffee and who isn't. It's really hard to know for sure how, how that really encompasses behavior that may not be genetic, right? Yeah, you know, but that's yeah. what they do. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. But the exercise has been something Melinda Irwin at our group at Yale has been very much in the forefront. We know from the earliest studies from Harvard that women who exercise have better outcomes with breast cancer. And, and what's interesting is if you look at colon, breast, and prostate, uh, you find a little difference. You find that, you know, consistent exercise in women reduces recurrence. And it can be both aerobic and non-aerobic exercise. In the prostate cancer, it was the intensity of the exercise and the, rather than just the duration. So the more active and the more, you know, the more um, uh, calories burned per, per hour, whatever, you know, in, in, the, in the calculations. And that was better. That had a better yeah. outcome? 
Yeah, okay. and in colon, okay. it was interesting. They found in the in some of the CLGB studies from Jeff Meyerhart that if you started to exercise at diagnosis and never exercised before, it actually improved outcome. If you exercised up until the time you had diagnosis and then said, I give up, you know, it didn't work, and you stop exercising, your recurrence risk went up. Mm. So it's an argument for not stopping exercise if you did, and even if you didn't, to start exercise after, because it has a really profound effect, about a 23, 30% improvement in outcome. Again, correlation, you know, these are observational studies, but now Melinda and the group from Harvard are, you know, are doing multi-center randomized trials looking at this, and that's really where it's going to, to determine what the exact benefit. But it, it does a lot of things. It's clearly one of the best ways without using insulin to improve insulin sensitivity in muscle. Because muscle, of course, is a crucial, uh, a crucial reservoir for glucose. And non-insulin-dependent glucose uptake is really maximized with exercise. I'll tell you a story real quick here. Um, we, we went in, my, so my son, he's on the USA bobsled team, and he's, you know, the, just these huge guys that have to push the sled as fast as they can. So he's, he's just very, very low body, or body fat and just tons of muscle. And he was eating this diet that concerned me, so many calories a day, huge bowls of rice. And so I went, we went in and got blood work together. And he, I went in fasted. We took it in the morning. And he had just eaten a huge bowl of rice with honey and some hamburger. Two hours. So it should have been right in that postprandial spike. We, we took the blood draw. And we went in with re- results. And um, mine was, I think, 88, 90. His blood sugar was 49. <laughs> and the doctor's like, are you okay? Are you dizzy? And he's like, I feel great. And, and so the only thing I could attribute to that too was that non-insulin dependent passive yes, uptake yeah. of glucose into the muscle. You know, and it, it yeah. gets at this fascinating argument about, well, exercise is not a good way to lose weight, which in general is true the way most people exercise. But what your son was doing is the one way you do, which is extreme high levels of activity daily probably more than like an hour a day, you know, as they say, one Starbucks will ruin your, your three mile, uh, your three mile jog, right? He was doing it at high levels. And therefore he was building muscle. His metabolism had changed. There's arguments about that recently that it doesn't reset your metabolism. It actually lowers your metabolism for strange reasons. And I, I, I don't want to get into that because those are very preliminary studies. The other thing I'll say about exercise and cancer is, um, there was a group from Germany, Roland Mertelsmann, who had been at Memorial when I was there. And he was doing, this was back in the days when we used very, very high doses. And by the way, this is another topic, using extremely high doses to cure metastatic cancer. And I want to touch on this because of the, where do we go, you know, with preventing and reducing cancer? And right. he, this was in, in transplant patients in, in women with metastatic breast. And they did something interesting. They had them exercise in the hospital with these, with these exercise um, aerobic machines. The women who exercise regularly during in the post-transplant period after chemo had faster recovery of their blood counts and were hospitalized for much shorter periods of time. They didn't measure insulin, any of the other mediators. But clearly exercise improved how they did on chemo. And so I routinely tell all my women, if you are getting treatment, exercise after, don't be afraid. Listen to your body, but you should exercise because it has these potential benefits. Yeah. And and, and what do you think of the, the, have you seen the studies by Walter Longo where he has the patients fast before chemo? Yes, of course. Yeah. And then, you know, he's written a lot about, you know, I was saying that he's the USC Longevity uh, Research Center there. And it's fascinating because he did it first in a neuroblastoma animal model. Uh, and what he showed was that fasting, but he was using dose of chemo in those animals that caused very high mortality, not the levels we use. Hmm. And those who fasted survived. But there was a very interesting little glitch in that, that he claims now that it's not the case, that those that, that didn't fast had a high mortality from the chemo but their plateau was higher than those who fasted. In other words, there might have been a greater survival from the treatment in those who didn't fast. The argument being that his argument has been, and he does 
have the paper, starvation reduces IGF and improves survival. And it was the IGF suppression that lowers proliferation in non-cancer cell, cells and tissues that reduces their risk of chemo-induced cytopenias, GI toxicity, et cetera. Um, and he's now doing the studies and shown some that actually do show benefit. And his other focus is, of course, on fasting mimicking diets, mm -hmm. you know, with prolon and other approaches that you can mimic a fast, but it's also with low calorie foods. You know, it really is designed to limit calories and limit insulin. It's all about insulin IGF. I, I, I found this fascinating, your hypothesis on the immune system in cancer. And I'll try to characterize it the way I, I understand it, which is as we evolved, evolution sort of had this necessity to reduce autoimmunity. Um, and the biggest cause of mortality throughout most of human history was infectious disease, right? Right. Exactly. And so, so that's what the immune system evolved to do was to, to fight off infectious disease and limit autoimmunity. And, and I think now it's pretty well established that many of the infectious diseases are triggers for autoimmunity. So the consequence of that is this limiting of autoimmunity is the ability of the immune system to survey the, the body for cancer and actually recognize it and attack it. It's sort of got this evolutionary straitjacket around it, in other words. And, um, you know, and now we're in this era of immunotherapy where this is the, the, the uh, in vogue, right? That we're going to yeah, solve yeah. cancer by, by the immune system. What are your thoughts on this? Is it limiting because of this evolutionary argument? Uh, yes. And, and, you know, what, what people fail to realize is the checkpoints, if you will, those things, and their checkpoints carries two connotations. One is the checkpoints on cell, cell proliferation in the cell cycle. Um, but let me go back a little bit uh, for perspective. Um, my early interest was pre-checkpoint inhibitors, you know, nivolumab, pembrolizumab, of which, by the way, I was the leading, uh, I spoke for Merck for five years around the country on the use of this in lung cancer. So I knew as much as anybody on the use of these immune therapies for lung cancer. And I'll explain why they work. And I explained to my, the individuals, the doctors about the evolution of the immune system and all of this. But my early interest was on the idea that were studies showing that elevations in, in T rays, regulatory T cells, correlated with adverse outcome with cancer. And that T, T rays are really suppressor cells that block the cytotoxic T cell population. And there's a mixture. There are, there are actually a number of different populations. There are the other group called myeloid suppressor cells. So as much as we've spent all this time interested in the idea of this PDL1, PD1 interaction, these proteins on the surface of tumor cells that will inactivate the immune cells when that protein is present, right? Mm -hmm. That's only one component of the immune suppressive network that fundamentally looks at cancer not as an adverse risk because cancers, as we said, now I didn't get to finish my comments, but what I was talking about with the Jerry Reven and all of that data is in the blacks is that cancer is an age. It's not just because you get older. It's a time phenomenon. So over time, many of these cancers evolve over 20, 30, or 40 years. So the average, for instance, ER positive breast cancer, most women are diagnosed in their 50s, in their 60s, or 70s. But the beginnings of that occurred in their 20s and 30s, even childhood. You know, your weight at early childhood lowers the risk. Your weight as an adult raises your risk because of the hormonal environment that activates the very beginnings of this multi-stage cancer process. Mm -hmm. So how do we get to the beginning? And I think that's the other thing we're all interested in ultimately, stopping it before it even begins. Mm -hmm. But fundamentally, this is a decades-long process. And so it's, it's time-related, not age, because it's, you don't have to get it in the, in the presence of the appropriate early exp, you know, environment, nutritional status, and insulin sensitivity. Remember, I told you that. Now, getting back okay. to the immune system and cancer, cancers, most cancers developed in your 50s, 60s, and 70s. Some people said it was a weakening of the immune system. No, it had nothing to do with that. It had to do with this multi-stage process and time it takes to evolve this. And again, the origins of diabetes and the rising incidence of diabetes, heart disease, and many of the Western cancers all followed a parallel rise 
from the early to the late 20th century. They all went up together, shared risks. And the cancer mortality affected people. The fundamentals of, of, of evolutionary biology and natural selection is you survive to leave, you know, to leave progeny. It's reproductive success. You know, and as Theodosius Stobjanski said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Evolution, yeah. And you've got to see evolution. So humans did not, now I, I did another whole series of studies looking back on the research on the incidence of cancer before the 20th century in the pre-modern era, pre-nutritional epide- uh, nutrition transition. If you look at modern populations now, they're all like us. And one of my favorite groups of studies comes from the, glo- the Global Burden of Disease Studies out of, out of Seattle. Institute for Health Metrics, Charles Murray. You should read the book about his life. It's fascinating. He is responsible for some of the best epidemiology of disease incidents and burden, global burden of anyone in history. He has looked at every country, every disease. They're all published in Lancet over the last 10 years. There are, no- there are hundreds of studies mm-hmm. looking at this. And he's shown how in the last 20 years, everyone else has caught up with us. But you need to look back where those populations had much less disease, much less cancer, because they were on the lower end of the insulin resistance path, right? Much more likely to be insulin sensitive, no junk food, physical activity. They didn't drive everywhere. You know, they weren't westernized. And, you know, even though there are flaws in some of the epidemiology, it's clear that they had lower risks. But the cancer issue was fascinating because it's a late disease and it doesn't impact on population survival. It has no evolutionary benefit to prevent a disease that occurs in in late grandmothers. Now, I'll tell you another part of this. That is, if you look at hunter-gatherers, what is their lifespan like? Hunter-gatherer women have their first period at maybe 16 instead of 12. They have their first child at 18. They breastfeed for three years. Then they have another child. And then they breastfeed for three years. Then they, of course, maybe lose one of their children. Then they go on. By the time they're 36, they're grandmothers. Now, if you look at early populations, grandmothers were were basically women whose children, they were grandmothers in their 30s and early 40s. Now we tend to think of grandmothers as being in their 70s and 80s. That's not the effect. And why do I say this? Because within the anthropology literature, there's a thing called the grandmother effect. That evolution favors having a grandmother there to help with the mother. And so there is a, there is a selection for healthy grandmothers to be around to help your child. But grandmothers through all of history were not in their 70s. Right. So there was no reason for evolution to protect us because the cost is excess autoimmunity. So if you have a very active immune response to a tumor that's nascent, you are going to end up rejecting the fetus. You're going to end up rejecting the healthy bacteria in your gut. You're going to end up with colitis. All of the autoimmune diseases that are due to the antigens that we see all the time that we need tolerance to. Now, then it gets to how did we figure out how to use the immune response to treat cancer? Well, it turns out it gets a little bit back to Vogelstein. The, the number one cause of high mutations is not just spontaneous mutation rate. Those tumors show very few neoantigens. A mutation, if it leads to a protein that's abnormal, may be seen as foreign. So the body will respond to that, right? So the one diseases that are most likely to have high mutations are largely carcinogen because not only do you get the three spontaneous mutations, but you superimpose on that carcinogen-induced mutations. So smoking-related cancers, ultraviolet light-related cancers generate much higher levels of what we call mutation burdens, with it a higher probability of having what we call neoantigens that the immune system would respond to. So what happens when the immune system sees a foreign antigen? It doesn't want autoimmunity. So what it does is, through a very fancy network of, of, of changes, the presence of an immune response to a tumor that has a new antigen generates an upregulation in gamma interferon, which turns on the PDL1 molecule on the tumor cell to turn off the PD1 receptor on the CK8 cell, the cytotoxic T cell, inhibiting the immune response because wow. the body doesn't want it. So the natural approach has always been to turn that off. 
So it's been there in these high carcinogen induced cancers who, that have high mutation burdens. You see this also in some virally mediated like HPV. But what's fascinating is we learn, and this is through my, my colleague at Yale, Li Ping Chen, who identified the pdl one and was able to show that it is crucial for autoimmunity. And that led to the work to develop an antagonist, a molecular antibody that either targets to PD-1 on a, uh, or the PDL one molecule. And that's where these checkpoint inhibitors came about. The second molecule, of course, is another one called CTLA-4, which is a second you know, inhibitor of the immune response. And that's targeted by ipilimumab or Yervoy. And that's been used a lot, in, particularly in melanoma, where you use careful combinations. It's more central to the immune response. And so when you turn off CTLA-4, it's not a peripheral inhibition, it's a central inhibition. And it leads to massive autoimmunity, high levels of you know, colitis was one of the side effects of, of high levels of CTLA-4 and some morbidity, a lot of morbidity, even mortality. So learning to adapt the dosing was critical and learning who would respond. Expression pd one the presence of high mutation burden. And so we're seeing, I have a number of people in their 80s who actually were given, who had high mutation burdens from smoking. I have a guy who's a dentist now, almost 90, and he has been cured of metastatic lung cancer with, with sequelation pembro pembrolizumab. So those subset of patients with that high mutational burden are the high, high responders to these. Is that, is that how you classify uh, Yes. It? Now, yeah, one of the okay. other things is we've seen people who recur, and I've found, and I have a case that I've, I'm writing up, of a woman who had progression after responding. And she had massive progression in her skull and in her bones and in her liver, right? And we, disc we put her on... After, after failing the immune therapy, being in remission, on Avastin and gemcitabine. She only got one cycle, and everything went back into remission. One cycle. And it turns out that Avastin and gemcitabine sequentially or together are known to affect the cellular component of the immune regulatory system. Uh, so Avastin decreases Tregs. Gemcitabine decreases the myeloid suppressor cells. So we think it unmasks the, the cellular suppression that had happened when she had this. And so we have studies showing her, her tumor. She got a little radiation on one side. That's the abscopal effect also. All the tumors in her skull disappear. Wow. Yeah, even though she wow. only got one spot radiated. Her lesions everywhere, and she lived for another year before she progressed again. Yeah, the abscopal effect I find fascinating. It, we talked about that with Jason Fung last on the last interview that the, m the majority of those sort of dramatic remissions from it they've been noticed you know th they were dotted throughout the literature but then once the checkpoint inhibitors came along the upscopal effect documentation of those cases right. just you know went through the roof um, now you also talk about this double-edged sword of the immune system where because it's so limited in its ability to to attack cancer. On the other side, its ability to this, this sort of systemic low-grade inflammation, these these pro-inflammatory cytokines are provoking cancer in many ways. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. and that yeah. that's that's the big you know the key is what is it that we can do to limit progression and the 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 microenvironment is crucial. You know, the genomics of cancer is so fascinating because the mutations may not be be just in the tumor, but they may be in the stromal cells. The IGF-1, yeah. we t tend to think of as coming out of, you know, liver, et cetera, but it turns out that IGF-1 is made by stromal cells. So local environmental fo focus, and of course, there's upregulation and inflammation, and how do we deal with that? Um, and I get back to the, the idea of targeting insulin, right? And I want to just finish, I don't want to finish, but I want to mention this very important series of studies using Mendelian randomization. And I'll get to, you know, because I think it's important not to lose track of how we figure out what's real, what's causal and what isn't. The first series of studies look at Mendelian randomization and breast cancer survival. They look at all the factors, alcohol, menopausal status, weight, pre- and postmenopausal you know, exercise, et cetera, and looking at genes that could explain the association between these many factors. One thing stood out, and that was women with, diabe with, a, with a predisposition uh, for diabetes 
showed the greatest association with breast cancer survival. Mm. So it really is the idea of diabetes as a precursor. And now there's a series of, of research studies from uh, a cooperative groups, including the Harvard School, looking at a thing called diabetes risk reduction score. And it's basically nine features of diet, including glycemic index, glycemic load, you know, high fruits and vegetables, coffee, coffee, which is a benefit again in this study, uh, other dietary features, et cetera, showing that it is a convincing association, not only with breast cancer risk, but breast cancer outcome. Those who score high, that is have low uh, diabetes risk reduction uh, indices based on these, these nine factors, have a reduction in recurrence, as well as a reduction in incidence there was a reduction in breast pancreatic cancer by 75% based on this. A reduction in endometrial cancer based on the level of your DRRD score. A reduction in liver cancer. Now, everybody probably should know that the old idea that liver cancer was due to viral hepatitis or alcohol has been basically, um, sub, it has been, suppressed, I shouldn't say suppressed, but has been clearly changed the epidemiology because of fatty liver. Most people don't even diagnose fatty liver. And I see patients who don't who come to me and I look at the presence of early risk for cirrhosis. And there's a way to measure that in the blood. It's called a fibrosis score. And then I put them through a couple of either ultrasound or MRIs that can identify the extent of, of, of fibrosis. And there have been people who came to me who had a, a, you know, fatty liver related progressive cirrhosis, one with thrombocytopenia and everybody's saying, oh, she's got ITP. I said, no, she has splenomegaly and she has early cirrhosis. So I got them all to my liver colleagues to treat them. And most people are not even aware that you can diagnose this condition early, but it's due to one thing. It's due to hyperinsulinemia, dyslipidemia, hypertriglyceridemia, it's all part of the same pattern. And that's why the DRRD score is linked to liver. Not related to alcohol or viral hepatitis, but this marked increase in fatty liver disease, which is leading to cirrhosis. By the way, that's why coffee is so good. Yeah, coffee, coffee, and Parkinson's. and uh, Yes. Well, the thing about coffee, as I'll just tell you, is it is the richest source of phytonutrients that you can get in any in a, in a concentrated form, and why it affects the liver is because the first thing that happens through through absorption is all of those nutrients that you get in that one cup go right into the liver through the portal circulation before out into the systemic. So your liver is being bathed by the highest source of antioxidants of any food. In Norway, they say it's the top eight, but it represents sixty seven percent of the antioxidants in the Western diet. No kidding. Yeah, yeah, that's that. again out of uh, out of University of Minnesota. So, so this connection I want to make real quick. We we started talking about pro-inflammatory cytokines stoking cancer. <clears throat> you went to insulin resistance, and the connection there is when someone's insulin resistance, they they tend to gain weight, visceral fat, and fat can then be viewed as an endocrine organ that's spewing out pro-inflammatory right. high. Right. So that's the connection. Okay. Exactly. I mean, and I will get to a fascinating study going back into the 19th, which is what's their best diet? And so there was a fascinating study in 2011 from British Columbia, and they simply did this thing. It was in animals, but they looked at low carbohydrate diet, cancer progression and, induct and initiation. And they went through a whole series of studies showing that the lower the carbohydrate, the lower the ability to induce a tumor, Right. Oh. And then it was synergistic with Celebrex in lowering cancer, the anti-inflammatory, showing the correlation between, and it was insulin. They measured insulin, they measured glucose, and clearly insulin was the mediator of this. And that gets back to, well, how do we apply this to human populations? If you look at these new Mendelian randomization studies, they're now looking at all of these diseases. The single most important mediator of risk for many of the cancers is the Mendelian randomization studies show it's linked to insulin. Insulin. It's always back to insulin. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Is there any phytonutrients that could sort of be a, a sidestep to that, that can inhibit the kind of early sensors, the provocative sensors that, that cascade inflammation? I mean, people always talk about curcumin. Is there anything in there that, that 
could inhibit like nuclear factor cap beta, which you talk about a lot. Before he lost his position, I used to have long discussions with the father of spices and medicine. I don't know if you know who I'm talking about, but he had really pioneered the work at MD Anderson in their cytokine lab. Um, Bharat Agarwal, very famous researcher there, but he, they found out that many of the the many of the illustrations were duplicated in many of his studies. They were the same illustrations. So, I mean, there was a whole host of problems. But he, we used to discuss this because the problem with curcumin uh, and turmeric was absorption, you know, and how yeah, bioavailable sure. is it. Mm -hmm. And actually, so this gets to another topic, which is repurposing. And I said to Barat, because I have a paper I'm writing up about a woman who lived for 25 years with metastatic breast cancer, and she was convinced it was my way formulation for, for down-regulating inflammation and chemoresistance. So NF-kappa B is a central mediator of inflammation, and it turns on chemoresistance as well. So if you turn up NF-kappa B, which is a you know, primary multi-molecule uh, um, activator of, the, of uh, inflammation, it will inhibit uh, chemotherapy efficacy. And so he, that's one of the mechanisms that he, he is actually one of the ones who described that, the NF-kappa B, as an essential mediator. Uh, and he was very interested in, in spices as a way of getting there and the phytonutrients like curcumin. And I said, but we're very fighting about how do we get, you know, and their approach is looking at different formulations to get better absorption. And I said, you know, Barack, I've been using a drug called clarithromycin. Now, what's clarithromycin bioxin? It's what's called a macrolide antibiotic, right? Now, what's interesting about, about clarithromycin, I had to go back into the literature, and I discovered that it was used for cystic fibrosis, chronic sinusitis, and a condition in Asia called bronchiolitis obliterans. It's a chronic bronchiolitis condition that was inflammatory, and it cured people with this. It was not infectious. And so the effect of clarithromycin had nothing to do to do with an antimicrobial effect. It was a marked inhibitor of inflammation. And it turned out when I went back and discovered it through some of the sinus literature, sinus and ENT literature, they documented it was a potent inhibitor of NF-kappa B. Now, fast forward, a lot of research has shown that clarithromycin has been incorporated into treatments for myeloma, including my colleague, Mort Coleman at, at Cornell, it called it, he calls it the BLT regimen, you know, by accident, <laughs> lenalidomide, whatever. And, and but it, it's very, it, it's it showed significant activity against myeloma. Now in Japan, there are a number of studies looking at clarithromycin as a way to potentiate the effect of chemotherapy, including one study in lung cancer, where they randomized people with non-small cell lung cancer to biaxin or clarithromycin or a placebo, and they doubled survival, or they actually tripled survival in those who took biaxin. Wow. Now, what's fascinating is I went to my colleague at, at Yale, uh, Roy Herbst, who is an expert in this. He said, oh, yeah, I, I heard they repeated that. They restudied it. And I said, no, Roy, nobody has ever gone back and studied it. The dilemma with repurposing medicines is there's no money to be made. Yeah. And so people yeah. will not study it. And I said to Barat, I said, biaxin is a much more potent inhibitor of NF-kappa B than is curcumin. And it's bioavailable. It's pharmacologically easily absorbed. It has side effects because of its SIP effects on other drugs. So you have to be careful. But this patient I reported on, every time she progressed, I would put her on an alternate chemo with biaxin. And she was convinced at 20 years into her disease that it was the biaxin that was responsible for why she continued to respond and get better every time we shifted her treatment. Wow. Yeah, it repurposing. Study, mm. That's the way to put I, it. I share the frustration. You see these promising studies, and there's many of them, and they just seem to beg for additional studies, but who's going to fund them, right, in, in the world of repurposing? What other drugs have you looked at with regard to repurposing? Well, of course, the, the famous one is metformin. And, and I will mention a study that most people have never heard of. And it is a, um, it is a study out of Harvard by uh, Hirsch, Iliopoulos, and, and, and Kevin Struhl. It's Struhl's lab in the biochemistry department at Harvard. He, he actually showed that metformin targets stem cells. He was one of the ones who showed the importance of cancer stem cells. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll get into the metformin in a minute. But what they did was they looked at what they call the transcriptional profile 
of common metabolic diseases and how they share a network of gene expression that include lipid, carbohydrate metabolism, and inflammation. And he has this wonderful illustration of how all of these diseases share common pathways. So we talked about common origins related insulin resistance as a beginning. And here he talks about the origins of cancer. And he showed, interestingly, in two isogenic animal models, that the most important gene that needed to be expressed to induce malignancy, and you will probably fall off your chair, was the oxidized LDL receptor. Oh. You need to have upregulation in the LDL receptor, the oxidized LDL receptor, to induce malignancy. Wow. Yeah, so now we're learning the importance of lipid metabolism. Our group at Yale is becoming more interested in the role of lipids and, you know, fatty acid synthase and targets that we never would have thought of. But in their study, they looked at lipid metabolism, carbohydrate metabolism, and then at the end, they had this very fascinating series of studies where they looked at different medicines and showed its impact on inhibiting tumor in their model. And they showed the benefit of metformin, the benefit of, uh, you know, statins, of course, was of interest, the benefit of multiple anti-inflammatory molecules. So it really showed that that this laid the groundwork for uh, the idea of repurposing. And of course, my other colleague, who's now dean at the uh, medical school at Emory, and he and I shared patients, and he developed a repurposing a program and a research arm that was based out of Brussels, Vigus uh, Sukhotny, who was at, yeah, at oh, yeah. Vigus, a renal doctor, and his whole focus was we need, and he has written a number of great articles on repurposing drugs for cancer. Yeah. And he has a number of reviews. And so I, I urge anybody who wants to read, look on that because he documents all of this in great detail. Yeah, he's, he, he's done a tremendous job. What, what I, the studies that I like that he talked about were going back to the 1950s. These two brothers did this really interesting experiment where they injected cancer cells into the portal veins in mice. And the control group, they didn't do anything with. The treatment group, they gave them, after they injected these cancer cells, they just gave them an incision across their belly and then let it heal about two weeks, did it again, and just repeated that. And then they, they autopsied them, they looked at the livers, and the, the mice that they did this incision to, just their livers were chalked with cancer. The control group, there was no cancer. Right. And right. The, the idea is that, that this just provoking of pro-inflammatory cytokines from the wound healing effect or the wounding effect was driving, allowing the cancer to take hold and grow. And then based on that, he went on to cite this Belgian researcher, he's a grad student who looked back through the data and noticed that if women who were getting breast cancer surgery were giving a preoperative shot of Carillac, which is an NSAID, um, they looked at the reoccurrence rate to those that did not get this anti-inflammatory compound, and it was, a, I think, a 75% reduction in recurrence is what they noticed. So the sort of the template is there is if you're limiting the effect of inflammation at the time of that wound, you know, the surgery, which is cutting, that it's reducing those cytokines and, and reducing the recurrence rate. Yeah, this is Duryea's famous quote. Tumors are wounds that do not heal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they use the cytokines of wound healing to potentiate growth. So I, I actually discuss this a lot. And uh, I've had patients, and I'll, I'll, there's, a, there's a researcher at, at Columbia who spent a lot of time comparing minimally invasive surgery for colon versus open laparotomies in animal models and showed all of the cytokines, including interleukin, and by the way, and you know, all and IL one, as well as uh, I, insulin related growth factor, all are turned on by more extensive surgery and promoting the idea minimally invasive surgery is better for tumors because of that risk of activating tumor growth. So, a patient comes to me with advanced uterine cancer and she sees a doctor as surgeon at Memorial. You know, I say the best of cancer care anywhere, right? I won't go beyond that. And he tells her, I want to debulk your tumor. And I tell her, no, that is a bad idea. Unless you can remove it all, don't have that. There's only one case where removing the primary is shown to be any, have any benefit, and that's in renal cell, where sometimes removing the tumor will have benefits. 
And that gets back to the Avast and the early studies on, on angiogenesis from Harvard and Judah Folkman. But at any rate, um, what happened was she went there. She had a partial resection. She came back to me a month and a half later. The tumor that she had resected was only partially removed. And the tumor had exploded in her abdomen, had tripled in size what was left within that short period of weeks. Again, noting how critical the microenvironment of tumor healing after surgery will, will impact on tumor growth. It's really dangerous. Wow. Let's go on to something else that you talk about a lot, which is the, the, the role of psychological stress in outcomes. Right, right. You talk about that, yeah, in the papers, in your book. And, you know, I, I think historically stress has been kind of hard to, to measure. Everybody has got some level of stress and how they report it varies. But you, you cited yeah. some studies where you actually measured the cortisol level in patients, which was very yeah. correlated to outcome. Yeah, yeah. you know, I, I will say I'm extremely lucky because one of my colleagues, David Felton, uh, is one of the co-authors of Psychoneuroimmunology, and he is one of the people who actually documented the, the neural intervention of the immune system. And he and I are still very good friends, and we've worked together for years. And, uh, and we've talked about how it's often overlooked and doctors don't always appreciate it. There, there was a time when it was a bad thing to say. You know, my stress caused my cancer. So you can't say that. And if you ask the public, and I've done a study where we interviewed women before they had breast cancer, and most of them used, believe stress was like number two or three in the cause, not cancer patients, but the general public. So it's a widespread belief, and there is significant role, but what is the kind of stress? And I always say, if you're a hunter-gatherer woman who just lost a child, right, and you've been kidnapped by the neighboring tribe, uh, that's stress. I mean, we have a population that is a little spoiled. And I think that the pandemic is bringing that out. You know, we have no historical perspective. We're now living through an enormous stress of a pandemic and people are like fed up, you know, and they don't realize that this disease, if it mutates into a much more virulent virus, never mind transmissible, could increase its mortality from less than 1% to 10%. I mean, that could be a big, that would be a big deal. We'd all serve, most of us would survive, but imagine 10% of a million people. That's 100,000 deaths in a short time. Yeah. So uh, my yeah, point being that we are not used to history. We are not very right. comfortable understanding the, the long-term perspective. I think that's a great point. Yeah, yeah. when you look back through the, the stresses that other civilizations and time periods had to endure compared to us, um, you know, we, we consider we can't go out and get coffee in the morning and this is a stressor sometimes. Yes. Yeah, that's a good point. So, yeah, the definition okay. of stress has changed. But people yeah. that now are... we get to the hormonal factors because right. one of the things that was... that, And this was a group out of, out of England in the, 19, in the early 2000s looked at a stress indicator for breast cancer survival and they came up with a thing called the MAC score. Uh, but they were looking at the idea, the, the, the things that played a role were helplessness and hopelessness. Hmm. Welcome to COVID, right? Yeah. <laughs> But helplessness yeah. and hopelessness were correlated with adverse outcome. Now, there are two ways of looking at that. Hopeless and, hopelessness and helplessness uh, is a paradigm that's very common among cancer patients who are told, you know, the placebo effect. I, this happens to me all the time. Somebody comes in and says, my doctor told me I had three months to live. No, sorry. Nobody can tell you that because you haven't even started any treatment. You don't know what your outcome is. Nobody can tell you that. Number two, it's all based on old data. So prognosis is always flawed because they're looking at data. And I write this in my book. You know, you can't give somebody a prognosis based on the past because that's all right. people have to go on. And yet they'll do this all the time. And I always tell people hope is not false. It's real. You know, I had a patient with end state with, with Kaposi sarcoma, HIV positive physician, and he had liver metastasis and lung metastasis. And everybody said he's dying. You got to go on adromycin. Within a month, highly active retroviral therapy came out and everything disappeared. Wow. And that was a discovery and, an, and a, you know, a, a medicine that had not been available the month before and everybody was telling him this. And we knew that this was in the pipeline and he went on it and he didn't need any chemo and he lived and he's still alive, I believe. But it's an example of the future cannot be predicted by the past. 
Yeah, and this notion of helplessness and hopelessness, a lot of the recent research is about social isol- isolation, yeah, which is a sense that of is hopelessness, part right? part of it, exactly, right. Yeah, and, and you know, the, the studies that go back are really fascinating. You look at rats, which are a very social creature, and when they put them, the, these rats that are predisposed to mammary cancer, when you put them in grouped cages where they're social, and then you isolate other rats at the same right. predisposition in single cages, and the the outcomes are, are incredibly different with, with the breast cancer. And then you look at the blue zones where, you know, you try to compare diet. People have combed through those. Why did these people live so long? And the only common factor that they can ha- find is this density of architecture, this, this focus on extended family and living in groups and people always are always together, stopping by. Yes. They're right. always together. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, you know, I think that's a huge underappreciated factor. Yeah, well, my it. son was in Ghana, and and you know we talk about uh, developmental world, developing world, and and the restrictions, and they are the most happy people. Now, I mean that's a superficial way of saying that, but their society is very different than ours. You know, they're not rushing around, they're not competing with each other to be better. Yeah, you know, the danger yeah. of America, you know, and I always say I'm not I'm an academic, but I'm not on the academic ladder because it irritates me that this is where the multi-billion dollar trials that extend survival by one and a half to two months or simply provide a surrogate improvement in, sur- in recurrence have nothing to do with survival. And yet everybody gets these studies and they have their names all over them and the drugs are then on the pipeline and then we're spending billions of dollars without changing outcome. And I'll yeah, get to another thing, which I think is really important, which is multiclonality and the evolution of cancer resistance. All solid tumors develop multiclonal progression over time. And it's the famous study of Swinton. Have you ever heard of the study, Swinton? Uh, oh, uh, I love that. He's in the yeah. UK, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the UK. And he biopsied renal cell cancer in the metastasis and in the primary tumor. And what he found was was they were none of them were the same. They all had different patterns of mutations, of chromosomal aberrations. They were like different cancers. Yeah. And that is the secret to why it's, all, it's virtually impossible to cure advanced cancers through our current techniques of targeting a mutation. Targeting, right, yeah. right. There's only yeah, one, I and they more. did the same thing in lung cancer. And this is fascinating because I have a patient with this. This, this uh, what they discovered was the same thing. They, they looked at a large number of resected lung tumors, and then they biopsied multiple sites within the tumors, and they showed what they call branch chain evolution of these clones. But they were able to go back to the first clone. There was only one population where they identified this. And guess what that was? It was EGFR in lung cancer. Oh, now, what is EGFR? Wow. Non-smoking related lung cancer, often in women, and the initiating event is a mutation in the EGFR, a, a, uh, a loss of EGFR that activates tumor growth. Now, I have a patient who had completely, now that's, they call it, if you look at the way they analyze the, the, the sequential evolution of mutations, it's the first one at the top. It's the first thing that happens. That's so that getting at how do we identify cancers before you can see them? You need to find that initiating genetic event. Now, what's interesting about, and I'm writing this up, I have a patient who was EGFR negative at diagnosis. And it was done here and at Memorial. He went a number of places. He was on immune therapy at a sustained, uh, a, a sustained remission, but he couldn't tolerate it. Then he had to go on chemo. And he was doing great. And he recently progressed. And he had a foundation CDX. That is the ability to measure mutations in the blood. And he had a, uh, a EGFR d- deletion 19, classic mutation for EGFR between when he recurred and he had another mutation now that's even more enriched in the tumor when it progressed. And he did not have that as the initiating event at the beginning. That's so he is an unusual patient who yeah. now has a clonal change and now is like a non-smoker. He was a smoker. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I love Charles Swanton's work. And I, I look at, and you contrast that to some of the points that Tom Safery brings up where with CML, where, you know, you can target it with Gleevec. 
it's got the Philadelphia chromosome, which right, is the initiating right. event always. But then you can have people with that mutation walking around without cancer. Well, that's true for, for all of us. For too. all of that's them. The yeah, so that, that goes back right. to your the, this bad luck paradigm where it's just this hardwired circuitry that goes bad versus it's this multi microenvironment thing where, yeah, certain mutations can germinate within a microenvironment that's conducive and others may not. Yeah, I, I agree, you know, and the microenvironment plays a huge role. The other factors now, it's not necessarily true for CML, but it is for even lung cancer now, obesity plays a role in insulin. So there's insulin IGF receptors. There are estrogen receptors on bronchial mucosa. And so women who are more prone than men, why is that? Well, it turns out that lung cancers also express aromatase, hmm. the enzyme that we target in breast cancer. And so there's studies looking at aromatase inhibitors to treat breast cancer. And that may explain why there's a preferential increase in women getting this non-smoking related lung cancer. Is it due to estrogen wow. receptors in the bronchial mucosa? Because I, I tell women when they come in on hormone therapy, why am I having this, this, and this? I said, the estrogen receptor is everywhere. It's in all your tissues. Uh, so one of our focuses is how do we get them to not stop their medicine because they get an increase in recurrence if they just say, I give up, I'm not taking it. So it's yeah. all about, you know, staying with it. Let me ask, I'm going to ask you one last, I've had you here for two hours. One more question for you though. How do you approach patient care, giving all these things we've talked about, insulin, the role of inflammation, stress, how do you approach, what's, what's, the, what's the Dr. Boyd's rules for when you get a newly diagnosed cancer patient? Um, I talk to them. I'm the only doctor who talks about the origins of cancer and try to help them because, you know, cancer patients come to you in a different way, you know, than they nor now, now 99% of the time they've seen another doctor who does not tell them anything about cancer. They tell them, this is how we treat it. This is, well, they're very good. They're very focused on best approaches for therapy, et cetera. But the patient comes in with these unanswered questions. Why did I get this? Yeah. You know, when I did it, we did a study of women in Connecticut across all demographics and women's beliefs about cancer or breast cancer origins. And it really, and most of what we learned is what they, what we, the misunderstanding about risk, you know, yeah. it's, it's due to stress is number one. It's, you know, I say, well, if, you know, stress caused your cancer and your husband gave you stress, your husband gave you cancer. <laughs> you know, so you got to be careful where you take that. Uh, as well as genetics. They overestimated the role of genetics. Now, I think we underestimate the role of genetics. And I will tell you a very interesting thing. If you look at, I told you about the BRCA2 gene and the evolution of higher risk over time, but the most common genes we look at are familial high-risk susceptibility genes, right? BRCA, BARD, et cetera. But there's another group of studies called twin studies, that yeah. look at heritability in Sweden, they did this for cancers, and that is identical versus not identical twins raised apart or separately, and they were able to show what's environmental, which is, which is hereditary because of the difference in identical versus not identical. And the heritability, which is the term they use for inheritance for breast cancer is not 12%, it's 25%. Wow. And that gets to the issue that I mentioned before about what other factors are linked to cancer? And one of the biggest ones is the heritability of prediction of risk of diabetes in the population. Mm. So even people who have a strong family history of type 2 diabetes, if they eat well and they're physically active and they do all the right things, their risk of diabetes is low, but they still have mild insulin resistance genetically. But those who, are, those who aren't careful and gain weight, they have a disproportionately high incidence of diabetes, and they are going to be the ones who might be more prone because of hyperinsulinemia to evolve to these malignancies. And then, of course, the general population reinforces the idea that high insulin is a predictor. Genetic predictors of high insulin also predict multiple cancers, as well as diabetes, yes. as well as heart disease. And so, but I talked to them about focusing on the things you can control, right? And get back to their misunderstanding about risk. So I don't want them to blame themselves. I also don't let them say, somebody told me I have X probability. You can't give numbers. I see in the very beginning, depending on the type of cancer, you know, I give them a, a whole focus on, on nutrition. I have large, you know, I have, I have information sheets that I make up. And I do a thing called a metabolic profile. 
I measure fasting insulin. I measure a more sophisticated lipid panel. Usually, uh, I use the Cardio IQ, which is a lipoprotein panel. I do C-peptide. I do CRP. I measure supplements. I do give them information about overuse of supplements and the risks. And I talk about suppressing insulin in, in limiting the levels of nutrients that may activate tumor cell growth mm -hmm. and how we focus on that and how early stage cancers can be suppressed for exercise. I give them all the data on exercise, all of this. And then I talk about their treatment and how we can maximize the treatment around the idea of looking at diet and lifestyle. If I, well, God forbid, if I ever get diagnosed, I know where I'm going. I'm going to see you. You are a true gem when it comes to all this. So the, the depth and breadth of knowledge and putting all these, connecting all these dots is just astonishing to me that you have this level of mastery over the subject, which is, I mean, you could spend a lifetime researching just a few pathways in a cancer cell. Well, that's, you, you know, know, the problem is this, and this is Howard Gardner is a Harvard a professor of education. I think he has a master's, but he never got a PhD. But he's written about the types of intelligence and, and how we approach life. And most people like accountants, biochemists are reductionistic. They yeah. narrow down to one little, and so most people are in a silo, right? And then there are the yeah. creatives. Those are the artists and the photographers, and I do like <laughs> photography. That's one of my hobbies. And then what's called synthetic thinkers which is looking for patterns. If I spent my lifetime in a laboratory, I would have a harder time doing this because I would be spending all my time on one pathway, trying to prove that that was the most important thing in cancer. When in reality, you need somebody to, to kind of synthesize all of this vast information. That's why I call myself a naturalist, a, a physician is naturalist. Evolution, anthropology, human history, epidemiology, all of this, synthesizing all this information to try to find out for them. And the most important thing I tell my kids, number two things, be curious, never give up your curiosity. And that's what kept me going at this age. And number two, never assume anything. There's a wonderful book by Adam Grant about assuming. And he writes about how it's one of the leading problems. People assume they know. Never assume. Yeah. Because right. we always assume we know. And I always say the best Answer is another question. Yeah, well, you know, the thing that I notice in talking to you and a lot of these very well-accomplished scientists is just this innate curiosity. You know, and unfortunately, that is hardwired into children. I, I remember when my kids were three, four years old, every question was why. Why, why? They're just innately, insanely curious. And then somehow that gets filtered out through the complexities of life, but scientists, the best scientists seem to retain that. They have this childlike quality where they're just asking questions all the time. And I know that's the, you know, the most, some of the most productive scientific research is just basic curiosity. They're just exploring in the dark. They have no idea of the outcome. It's not directed research. And, and that's when you get these profound, you know, right. uh, results. Yeah. The idea of funding research, not for a target, but exactly. to understand. You know, I, exactly. I have to show you yeah. this book that I, you know, it's called, I don't know if you see it, it's called First Cell. And this is written by a hematologist oncologist at Columbia. She used to be at Rush in Chicago. She was the wife of uh, really a, an esteemed Harvey Priestler, who was an esteemed hematologist who herself died of cancer. And her interest is switching paradigms. Stop trying to cure cancer by going after the last cell. We need to learn to get to the beginning. I'm going to quote, I'm going to write what she says at the end. She has a great quote. If I might find it here somewhere. And this is called the first cell? The first cell, yeah. And she she really describes, you know, abundantly in her, in her, um, in this, her profound interest in caring for the patient and not hurting them and how over and over again, we keep repeating the mistakes of trying to use high-dose drugs and things that really don't change. And so here's what she said. Um, Only the profound suffering of cancer patients has the power to ignite a brand of compassion necessary for demanding urgent and dramatic change, which is part of this is about, there was a fascinating book called Malignant by a researcher, you know, an oncologist in Oregon who wrote about all the problems of the current paradigm for cancer, which is hype and bias in 
and yeah. cancer trials. And I said, you would think he was talking about alternative therapies, but he wasn't. He was talking <laughs> about how the pharmaceutical world and universities are funding huge studies for limited to no benefit and yeah. hugely expensive drugs. They are going to bankrupt America with this. I know oh, yeah. because my, my last year in private practice, my monthly bill for chemo was $500,000. I had wow. to pay 500 I couldn't afford it. I lost my house because of that, by the way. Wow. And that's a whole other story. Yeah. I, I, yeah. The, the, the dynamics behind the money question is you keep, you know, I think that's an intrinsic human, human bias too, is this complexity bias where we want the, the newest, most technologically things. We right. just assume they're going to be the, the best. brightest now thing we, in the sky. It's like, uh, yeah. like cryptocurrency. I want one of those right. coins. <laughs> well, right. I think CAR T therapy, right, is about two hundred fifty thousand yes. a treatment, exactly. and that's just entirely unsustainable. That's but right. it goes back, you know, to you. You mentioned this patient advocacy driving change. I think of the story that, and you probably remember that the when the radical mastectomy was the the surgery for breast cancer. Yeah, and this went on for I think eighty years, and no I, one I questioned was, it. I was present at discussions in our when I was a, tra a trainee in oncology. People arguing against lumpectomy and radiation. Right. And it, it, arguing I, against it and the value of mastectomy was the only way to operate, right? And it was out of fear. I, the only way I can, yeah. you know, sort of characterize it. Failure to study it. People did not. to study it. it, it, it yeah. is, the way we use language, who, you know, you know this is a war. We frame cancer treatment as a war. Right. Who doesn't want the most radical Surgery that your surgeon yeah. is saying has the best chance of a cure. Holstead idea, you know, and that yeah, was Trinity Holstead. surgery, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and we it took realized, uh, Bernie uh, Fisher and others, that uh, breast cancer is a systemic disease at the beginning. Right, a failure and of, course, of understanding. And then the other yeah. side of the coin is with metastatic disease, we can use these very high dose chemotherapies with transplant, you know, with stem cell transplant to cure breast cancer. And we had everybody embrace the idea. It was being done before the evidence was really shown a benefit. There was marginal improvement in response rates, but no, the only they did five randomized trials of this finally after it'd been in practice for like seven or eight years, and four out of five failed. The one that wow. proved to be positive from South Africa was found to be fraudulent. Never assume. Never assume. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so we now know high dose chemotherapy is no way to cure metastatic disease. It may yeah. be through Larry Norton and the early work of Bonadonna that higher dose adjuvant therapies for chemo can impact it, but it's not high, high, it's moderate dose and dose intervals so you can shorten it. As we know, what's called dose dense ACT, given every two weeks is better than every three weeks using growth factors. That has shown benefit, but you can't push it too far. And mm -hmm. Bonadonna showed that moderate dose is better than high dose. You know, wow. when you use CMF, you know, and so it's a fascinating yeah. idea, but that doesn't translate into metastatic cancer. Hmm. So now you have ideas of, you know, metronomic dosing and low dose chemo and added non chemo agents that may enhance response. But I'm going to just, I didn't finish quoting her. And you got to, this is really crucial. The future in preventing cancer uh, is in preventing cancer by identifying the earliest markers of the first cancer cell rather than chasing after the last. Now, one okay. of the things that the Swanton study showed in lung is the first mutation was the EGFR mutation, right? But that's mm -hmm. rare. You don't chase after everybody, every woman, and measure circulating tumor for an EGFR mutation because there might be a lurking uh, EGFR positive clone of cells in the lung. So that's our challenge is to find out what are those first changes that, that eventually lead to the evolution of malignancy. And how do you use that rather than waiting for screening tests? Yeah, as, and if you could you know, identify that, what, what would be the intervention at that point? I'd assume it'd be the low toxicity, like perhaps repurposed antibiotics like you talked right, about, exactly, diet. Right. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah. it would be a combination of repurposing, I would hope, and, and uh, you know, more aggressive dietary particularly in people who we know already have pre-existing risk, measuring insulin resistance, et cetera, and then fo carefully following them. We now have a study in high-risk women uh, who have, for instance, breast cancer. It's called the DARE study. And they are being randomized with ER-positive breast cancer 
who are then placed on hormone therapy. And at six months into their treatment, they get a molecular test called Signatera that's designed to measure residual, what we call um, uh, minimal residual disease, MRD. And so you can identify the presence of mutations of their cancer, which we already know from their first biopsy. So they get the original tumor DNA. We know the mutation pattern. And then we follow them over time. And the trial is measuring this at intervals. And in one group, when you see a, a positive test, you intervene with a change in therapy. You may put them on a PDL, what's called a uh, checkpoint inhibitor, different checkpoint inhibitor, what are called uh, CK46 inhibitors to enhance the effect of the endocrine therapy. And the other group, you follow them and see what that means. But mm. it's identifying the first sign of a re recurrent tumor. Sure, right, right. Molecular tests. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you again, Dr. Boyd. My pleasure. Yeah, I really appreciate your time. Um, and your book, tell us the name of your book again. Well, it's called The Cancer Recovery Plan. It's many years old. And so wait for the next one. I have to do a series of, uh, I was going to do nutritional stages of cancer, but I realized that I want to do it in a series of smaller books because each one would be long, which would include pre-cancer, you know, how to prevent cancer, early stage cancer, how to, how to limit progression, late stage cancer, what you can do, and then end stage cancer, you know, how to manage the side effects of treatment and, you know, and, and your quality of life at the end of life. Yeah, we need, you need to get that done. We need to have this body of knowledge you have down. And the other one timeless. is Boyd's Rules, the supplement book, which is really important because nobody knows about this. Yeah, no, that information is critical, I think. To, yeah, you're right. There's a big lack of information. All right, well, listen, enjoy the rest of your day. I appreciate your time and we'll, we'll chat soon. My pleasure. Thanks. Okay, take care. Take care, Travis. <laughs>